this session on institutions. We have four, can I have your attention please? Thank you. So we will have four presenters today and here are the rules of the game. Each person gets half an hour. The, uh, the presenter will get 15 minutes to present their work. The discussant will get four minutes and we'll have 10 minutes for a Q&A at the end. So our first presenter is Francesco Cecchi. Okay, first of all, I want to make sure the mic is on. Can you all hear me? Great. Uh, I'm going to present a paper about the interaction between formal and informal legal institutions. In fact, many areas around the world, in many areas around the world, customary courts uh, provide prompt, accessible, uh, and cheap justice services. And especially these justice services are typically coherent with uh, local egalitarian redistributive norms, in general local, local customs. This is particularly true in uh, many areas of sub-Saharan Africa, especially rural areas. However, um, these customary courts and these customary legal institutions may also perpetuate uh, biases, discrimination against disadvantaged groups. Typical examples are minorities, uh, ethnic minorities or women. So what happens to these informal legal institutions once the law uh, penetrates or becomes more competitive, more and more accessible to people? Well, this may result in uh, direct socioeconomic gains uh, for the underprivileged, for the ones that were discriminated before. There's, there's a working paper by Sandefur and uh, Siddiqui, two people that were previously at Oxford that looks at the direct gains of increasing the competitiveness and the competition of formal legal institutions. But if there is credible social sanctioning, we may have face a situation in which uh, agents or the people in the village do not want to deviate from the norms, even though the norms are uh, less preferred than the law because they fear social sanctioning, they fear for the reputation of themselves and their households. So, then in that case, indirect effects may be more salient. What do I mean by indirect effects? I mean that perhaps these institutions, the judges that, that over, uh, oversee these, the verdicts may not face uh, the same social sanctioning mechanisms that agents face. More in general, understanding the interaction between formal and informal institu legal institutions is central to achieving fair and functional legal systems. So that, that's, that's basically the bottom line, the motivation of this paper. What are the questions we're going to try to answer? Well, first of all, does the increased competition of a formal law reduce the biases, the customary biases I just mentioned? And are the arbitration decisions of customary judges drawn closer to the law? This is what Aldashev and, and others in, their, in a theoretical paper called the magnet effect. And then last but not least, are disfavored agents taking advantage of their increased bargaining power once the the, legal alter the formal legal alternative is introduced. So what do we do? We study the effect of introducing a costly formal uh, law on the decisions of, of villagers in rural Ethiopia and on the decision decisions of real customary judges in, in, in the same area. These customary judges are, are known as Shimagele. We find indeed that arbitration bias against female participants is, is strong. We find that uh, a judges fav uh, favor known pl plaintiffs, plaintiffs, and we find that introducing a legal fallback reduces such biases and draws the decisions of judges closer to the law. However, we find that agents do not respond to uh, an increased uh, uh, legal, to an increased bargaining power. So this is the outline of the presentation. I'm going to present the experiment. We do this by the means of a lab experiment. Why do we do a lab experiment? Because it's very hard to have naturally occurring data, to collect naturally occurring data about uh, customary arbitrations and cus customary legal outcomes. Why Ethiopia? Well, because Ethiopia is one of the countries in Africa that has the most widespread use of customary judges. There's more than 60 customary uh, legal systems in Ethiopia. And we are looking at the Amaras Shimagele in the, in the northwest of the country. And it's a system that is more or less in line with the principles of arbitration. There are two litigants, there are two plaintiffs, and they don't agree on something. They come together, they decide 
they identify a judge, they go to him, and the judge makes a decision, an arbitrage. Um, they're typically elders, religious leaders in the community. They're very respected, and they do this not for a monetary outcome, but because this gives them prestige at, at the community level. And uh, customary outcomes are, have been found by anecdotal uh, and anthropological literature have been found to be largely unfavorable to women. We look at 532 uh, household heads that had participated the previous year to uh, uh, agricultural related survey. Si and we select four well-established Shimagele local judges from uh, 15 different uh, uh, Kebele in West Gojin. And then we let people play. There are two versions of this game. In one game, we'll see later what happens. Uh, the only legal institution that exists is the customary judge. And in the other one, we also have the law. And because we vary at the session level, there are 15 game sessions. The, the numbers the, in our sample are slightly different. So the design is, 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 is rather ad hoc. I hope you don't mind this. But this is because we want to induce sort of a lab-generated dispute, right? So we, we first assign randomly either 80 or 120 tokens to each, uh, to each participant, to each uh, villager, and we let them play two risk games. Uh, the idea behind this is that we want to make use of the earned income effect. The idea that once you, you, you make an investment, you earn money, you think that you deserve it because you made an effort, you'll actually be less willing to, to give it away or to share with somebody else. We also play this on a, on a first day and then we give them an endowment, we give them a card where their, the amount of money they won at the end of the session is written on and it's sealed into an envelope and we want to make use of the endowment effect. So the idea that the next day they don't want to trade their, their endowment they earned the previous day uh, f uh, with their partner. And this brings me to the next point. The next day, we ask them to play the same exact investment games, but with an anonymous partner in the village. So they had to make it along the lines of intra-household bargaining. We asked them to play the same risk games in sort of a joint venture. We randomly assign, we, we first split the sample in half. The, uh, the, the wealthiest half and the least wealthy half, and then we randomly assign them to an anonymous partner. And on average, the higher investor in the joint venture has twice as much endowment, twice as much investment into the joint venture than the lower investor. So we create uh, an exogenous variation. It's exogenous by construct because of the initial randomization. So we, 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 we show this in the paper that uh, it's not correlated to risk preferences in which there's, there's one partner in the joint venture that invests much more than the other one. At the end of the joint venture, each, uh, then one partner, then we play an ultimatum game. One partner is asked to, to make an ultimatum offer and the other person can accept or reject. That's a standard ultimatum game. The only difference is that if the, the, the receiver rejects, the offer is sent to the customary judge. And this is where the customary judge first enters the game, right? So then the decision on how to split the joint venture capital is made by the customary judge. Now we expect the customary judge to uh, apply strict egalitarian norms. We expect therefore lower investors to be favored customarily. And in the subtreatment where we introduce the formal law, we propose an alternative idea of fairness. And that is applying the liquid and, uh, liquidating dividend policy so everybody in the joint venture gets the same share of, of joint capital as they invested at the beginning. So if I invested two thirds of the capital at the beginning, I'll get back two thirds uh, at, at a cost, 10% of the joint capital. We sort of try to mimic the, you know, it's a fictional uh, measure of the, of the cost. Let's go a bit fast because time is flying. First, we look at the post arbitration payout. So anybody that, that, that has a litigation, we have uh, a reference point of the decision of a, of a customary judge. We look at the payout and how it's distributed, whether there are biases there. Uh, next, we look at arbitration bias, and it's, I think it's not the right word of putting it, but in this case, we're just looking at how distant the arbitration is from a proportional split, from the law, right? So the word bias is just the, the, the shortest word to define a deviation from a formal law or from the proportional split. The same we do with the ultimatum offers, right? Because we want to look at the behavior of agents. We want to see whether the formal law changes the behavior of agents, both higher investors and 
and lower investors, and then we look at uh, the likelihood of rejecting offers. So let's see, let's look at the first result. We find strong, uh, robust evidence that there is a bias against female. That's the first coefficient there in the top left corner. Uh, on average, female receive 30% less uh, payout than, than men. We don't find evidence that uh, the customer judges favor known plaintiffs. We only find that they favor known plaintiffs if they are lower investors. So that is uh, this coefficient here. So we only find evidence when we interact it with, with higher risk. So they only favor known uh, players if they are also favored by the custom, so if they're lower investors. Now, if we introduce the low, if we look at the sample uh, of the low, if, notice these numbers, these are not everybody, right? Because we, we can only look at people, thank you very much, that, uh, that have entered the litigation. We see that these effects disappear. Actually, women have a positive, uh, is a positive sign, but, but not significant. So what we see here is that the deliver legal fallback reduces customary biases. Next, we want to see whether what happens. So what happens to the decisions of referees, of, of customer judges? Well, in the customary only setting, we see that more than, slightly more than 50% of the judges go for the 50-50 split, right? The, uh, the empty uh, bars here represent how much people have invested initially into the joint venture, and this is how much they receive in the end. Once we introduce the law, we see that customer judges adapt their arbitrations significantly. However, it's also significantly different from the law itself. So they don't adapt completely. It's a partial adaptation. Um, uh, if we look at the regressions, we see that there's the uh, deviation from the law is reduced by 10 percentage points. Um, Let's now look at the agents, and this is, I think, quite interesting. We would expect higher investors to, to make offers that are closer to the law once the law is introduced, because the law favors them. They want to make an, a, a proportional split. Instead, what we see is they make offers that are closer to the 50-50 split. They make more, 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 they're more likely to make 50-50 split offers. So this goes uh, against the idea that just introducing or uh, getting more access to the formal law will actually make, will benefit uh, people that are damaged by the customary uh, institution. What we see here, so this is, there's absolutely no effect of the law treatment, but if we just look at, uh, we look at interaction term, we see that there is a significantly, a significant increase of the distance from the proportional split. Last graph that I want to show, uh, the orange crosses are rejected offers and the blue dots are accepted offers. And we see that the orange crosses here are a bit more uh, sparse than in the customary only setting, and that the blue dots are a bit more prevalent. Here, this is the sign that a lot of people went for the 50-50 split. These, these are the offers made by the higher investors. So we see this in the data. The low treatment reduces offer rejections. Introducing a formal law reduces the, the disputes, but this is completely driven by uh, by lower investors, so these two cancel out. Conclusions, introducing a costly legal fallback does reduce arbitration biases. It draws customary arbitrations significantly closer to the formal law. However, agents favored by the law do not take advantage of it. In, uh, they do not take advantage of their bargaining power or as is also referred to as the, uh, the BATNA, the best alternative to uh, a negotiated uh, agreement and disfavored agents passively adapt. So what is, thank you very much, what are the implications for, uh, for policy? Well, we cannot assume that uh, introducing formal institutions, introducing formal law will simply move the outcomes at the, at the community level in communities where informal legal institutions are present and, and vibrant. They will bring just, just closer to the law. What we actually find is that customary institutions may have a very strong role to play in changing undesired norms. They are the only ones in our setting moving away from, from the customary norm. On the other hand, and this is something that I mentioned in the paper but didn't mention in the, in the, in the, in the presentation, formal uh, law may also lead, limit the redistributive role of customary institutions. In our case, for instance, the customary institutions typically sort of divide in a, in a strict egalitarian way, and once the law is introduced, they, uh, their power to do so is, is limited. 
So this is important to, to remember. Thank you. So I'm going to discuss Francesco's paper. So it's a really well-written paper. I know very little about this topic, so do take my comments um, with a grain of salt. But I really did uh, enjoy reading the paper. I learned a lot um, ha not having known much about this, this issue. I think here, okay. So here are the paper's selling points the way I see them. First one is that the literature on this issue is really thin, despite its, its, its importance in the Ethiopian context and in the context of African, um, many African countries. So it's, it, I think just having a paper out there is, on this issue is a contribution to begin with. It's an impressive lab in the field experiment in which real customary judges and clients participated. So I think the fact that they, they were able to conduct a, a lab and field experiment of this nature is, is a commendable feat in, in itself. And I think it's, uh, there isn't as much value put in the discipline. I think uh, it's slowly being recognized that uh, the kind of, uh, the, the fact that doing experiments like this, running experiments like this is not an easy task is being recognized. And uh, I think it's, uh, this was well done. And the third one, randomization of uh, legal fallback treatment allows precise estimation of impact. And it allows the authors to get away from a lot of the issues about selection bias and um, endogeneity and various issues that uh, we have to deal with in, in observation, observational data. So it's, it's, you, you have a nice way of getting around most of these issues at the cost of um, sample size, but still uh, you do get away with um, many of these issues. I have a few questions. So the first one that I have is about the interpretation of the main result. So the way you interpret the results is that Competition from formal law reduces biases in arbitration outcomes, right? Could we, is, is an alternate way of looking at these outcomes, you could, all, could, could you also say ability to appeal the decision reduces biases in arbitration? So if you completely took away the effect of formal law and just added an institutional feature in which people were allowed to appeal their decision, would, could you have given, gotten the same result? And I, I guess you might have gotten the same result. And, and, and that might be a weakness in these customary institutions, right? That, that you can't, if you're not happy with the decision, you can't do anything about it, right? So I think that might be an alternate way of, inter, of, your, of um, interpreting these results. The second comment is about women in the sample. Now I realize, you don't mention this in the paper, but now I, I realize during the presentation that you're looking at household heads. Yeah, but I, because women are really important in the study, the fact that only less than 10% of the sample are women is, is a little worrying. Um, so at least acknowledge that issue and, dis and explain why, why you do that. Um, and I think, um, and, and because you, you carry through um, this analysis on, on women, the outcome on women throughout the papers, so I think that might be an issue to, to explain uh, and justify fairly um, well. There are also other groups that are disfavored in society, and you, in addition to women, you, you could also have looked at younger um, uh, respondents or poorer respondents described by the community, or less educated or ethnic minorities, and those are all those could be potential um, disfavored community, uh, dis disfavored groups um, in the community. And um, would you did you look at those other disfavored communities? And if you did, uh, what did you find? And uh, policy implication, so I think you, one uh, policy implication of this is to introduce more formal courts because that introduce, con introduces competition and that reduces biases in, in the arbitration outcomes. But we all know that, that, uh, that these customary courts, these formal courts have problems of their own, right? So is it, do we want to introduce more formal courts or do we want to improve their functioning, right? So that's, that's, um, that isn't uh, clear. It's not clear what, is, what the policy implication of your study is. Okay? Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, well, very good comments, I would say. Uh, yes, the ability to appeal to the, appeal the decision reduces biases. We could have done a sub-treatment where we, could, uh, we, we would look at that. In the end, this is, this is really what, what we're, we're looking at. 
as long as the appeal, but in this case, the appeal has a clear outcome. So it's, it's, we know, everybody knew it was, it was full information about what the outcome of the appeal would be, but, but indeed, it's, it's that. Uh, why were women undersampled? Well, we, we had cons budget constraints. We were doing something based, uh, we already had collected the data, so we were using a data set, a survey data set that we already had. Um, household heads tend to be men, uh, vast majority, so this is what happens. Uh, we find a very strong effect, so we are not worried about uh, power, but it would have been better uh, if we had collected more information about women. It's, it is coherent, though, that we're looking at household heads, right? So it, the opposite would have happened if we were looking at non-household heads. We would have too many women and very few men. And if you combine the both, then you would still need to uh, put sort of an interaction term of the effect of women being or not being in a household head, so you use not necessarily solve the issue. What about other groups that could be disfavored? Yes, we look at them. In one of the regression tables I show them, we look at age, for instance. It doesn't seem to matter. We look at education. These are ethnically coherent communities. They're in the middle of um, the Amara uh, region of Ethiopia, and everybody uh, except for one uh, person in our sample is, is Amara. The same applies for religion. Everybody is Christian Orthodox in our sample. Uh, policy implications. Introduce more formal courts or improve their effectiveness. I would add another or. I would say that here what we're seeing is that just introducing more formal courts will not necessarily help. There are, these communities face social sanctions. People do not go necessarily to the rule of law. The indirect effect is what is, what is at play. So policymakers should maximize the, the, the indirect effect. So ma maximize this magnet effect, try to induce uh, informal courts to, uh, to adapt or to get closer to the law, which is very different from trying to induce agents, villagers, to go to, form, to formal forums, legal forums. An example of this is the case of the Philippines, in which the first, um, the first tribunal where everybody in the rural areas has to go is, is, a, is a customary court. And then if you're not satisfied with the decision of the customary court, with elected officials at the village level, you can appeal to, uh, to a formal court. So perhaps this is a policy implication that, that goes beyond just more courts or, or more effectiveness. But when we talk about increased competition, yeah, we sort of cluster those two together. What, what is the effect of having you know, more reachable, cheaper custom, uh, formal, formal uh, tribunals? You can also use the second. Yes. Great. As the mic runner, I think I'll take advantage and ask a question myself. Um, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions, actually. The first is uh, more, I guess, by way of a clarification. Uh, to what extent do you think your, uh, your experiment reflects the kinds of decisions that are actually made by these customary groups on the ground? Uh, I mean, I'm from India, and obviously there's a lot of adjudication and arbitration in terms of money disputes and so on, but there's also a lot of family issues or family disputes that also get resolved, perhaps along different ways. Um, and my second question is kind of related to uh, something the discussant also brought up, uh, which is that did you think in your experimental setting that knowledge of what was constitutional or legal changed the decision made by the customary leaders? In other words, is there a channel by which our customary people can be more truthful if they know, uh, can be more, uh, well, less biased if they know what is constitutional in this context? Right, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, to, to answer the first one, uh, the, I, I will answer it in two ways. First of all, these customer judges do uh, sort of participate in, in, in arbitrage on very different questions. Some are related to intra-household uh, issues and they go up to murder, solving, well, solving uh, sort of uh, dispute resolutions uh, related to murder, although it's officially illegal for them to do so, but this is actually happening a lot. Typically, it would be about uh, an exchange, a trade, uh, where something went wrong in the, in the or, or about land, for instance, or, or labor markets at the village level. That's what they would typically do. And uh, this is why we wanted to frame it as a joint venture, where you make sort of a joint investment, and then at the end, well, you have a joint capital, how we're gonna split it if we can't find a compromise. That's what they would typically do. And then the second thing we did, which unfortunately I, I noticed I did not stress a lot in the presentation, is that the arbitration, the customary judge was non-anonymous. So we, we thought by making it non-anonymous, so before making the ultimatum, ultimatum offer, 
the, the sender knew that if, he, if the offer was rejected, it would go to that specific judge, and he would know whether he knew the judge or not, and he would also know that the judge would have had uh, the information revealed. It was non-anonymous, confidential information that, that was revealed uh, during the play. And so we thought that by, by doing so, we would actually include the sort of the dynamics within the village, the reputational dynamics within the village, the social sanctioning dynamics within the village. That's what we tried. And then of course, it's, it still remains a lab experiment, right? So. Uh, your findings, normally the, the final institutions and the outcomes are, okay, in actual social setting would be out of the repeated uh, interaction, mm -hmm. or it's more of a repeated game right. where you observe what someone has done and then you act accordingly. So I'm just wondering, this one-shot game, or if you play a game once, how you're able to conclude that this is sustainable, this is the path uh, the institutions will take. So I was just wondering whether you plan to do more of such to confirm of the final path or right. how we can... So that's, that's, a very good, that's a very good question, thank you. And that's another reason why we, tried to, we made the decision, the arbitration decision non-anonymous. We tried literally to embed this one arbitration within the... So it was sort of a special arbitration setting within the normal uh, going of events at the village level. So we had local customary judges and you know, th their reputation would be transmitted to the to period P plus one, right? So if they made a completely biased a decision favoring one person completely or the other person different from what they normally do, this would have had repercussions in, in the future. So they, had, they really had to make uh, very wise decisions. We should have done, of course, the anonymous treatment as well. We had issues of sample size, but it would have been really nice to, to observe what would have been different when we were looking at the anonymous treatment or the, the non-anonymous uh, version of the treatment. Thank you. So our next presenter is going to be Francis Mwesige. He's going to present on population pressure, rural to rural migration, and evolution of land tenure institutions in Uganda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for coming uh, to this presentation. I'm presenting on uh, the evolution of land tenure institutions, and I'm mainly interested in uh, looking at how uh, intercommunity migrations influence uh, this change in land tenure arrangements, mainly from the customary communal setting two, uh, still informal, but more of privatized land ownership. Uh, there is a large and growing uh, board of literature on the role of private land ownership and how they uh, influence uh, production decisions and lead to agriculture development. And it is highly believed that uh, the prevailing customary uh, communal land institutions curtail uh, investment in land, land transactions, uh, access to credit because land cannot be used uh, for uh, as a collateral for credit access, and then it translates into lower productivity, agricultural productivity, and entire poor performance of agriculture sector. Uh, so, th because of this, uh, transforming customer land institutions from communal setting to more privatized ownership has been the agenda since 1970s. Uh, of most African countries. How do we make land more privatized so that uh, agriculture can respond? Uh, but there are issues uh, related with that. First of all, it's costly uh, to say to, to facilitate everyone get a title. So it's costly. And the secondly, there is also opposition and resistance from, uh, info, uh, from individuals themselves in communities. Some claim their customer institutions are strong enough and they protect them, 
Others claim uh, there are this fear of elite capture when it comes to typing and registration, and we've seen there are studies on that where they bring in the program, uh, there are some people who actually grab land and register that land, those are mainly the educated and the informed. So because of that, there is a huge debate, what should we do? However, there are studies that show that if you leave these institutions, they evolve over time. Uh, this is more the endogenous growth theories. So these theories that have been advanced, one of them comes from the seminal work by uh, Hayami and Rutan in 1975. They say that uh, institutions evolve endogenously in response to economic uh, dynamics and more of demographic changes. And these are more in line with Bozalapian uh, theory of uh, agriculture intensification of how agrarian economies change as population increases, people tend to adapt more, uh, land saving technologies and institutions evolve endogenously without any external intervention. Uh, there is another uh, theory of evolution, theory of land rights, uh, which argues that African indigenous uh, systems are flexible and they are able to evolve endogenously in response to population uh, pressure and land scarcity. Uh, then also the studies by uh, Atwood and Migo Tadora kind of uh, bring up the same premise that institutions can evolve. However, we don't have empirical evidence. We don't know if they do uh, evolve, how do they evolve? What are the factors that lead to this evolution? And this is mainly uh, the objective or the rationale of this study. So some descriptive studies find uh, more private or higher incidence of private land ownership in communities that uh, have many immigrants. Uh, one interesting study by Fred Mensah uh, in 1999 was in Ghana. They found that southern communities, the southern region of Ghana, had more private land ownership and that same region had more immigrants. So there is this correlation that is found. Still related story by uh, study by Miguel Tedora et al. Uh, they had a study in three countries, including Rwanda, including Ghana, and Ethiopia. Uh, I've forgotten the third country, but mainly what they find is the same correlation. Where there were more immigrants, land or customary institutions were weaker, and land was much more likely to be privately owned. So then, this suggests that uh, probably uh, migrations, ethnic diversity, community heterogeneity affects the functioning of this social cohesion, the social capital, and the functioning of informal institutions, and could lead to maybe evolution of the institutions, as more specifically land tenure institutions, more privatized ownership. And then there is also a need to analyze the implications of this evolution to agriculture performance. So the objective of this study is, first of all, to ascertain whether land institutions are evolving in Uganda. Uh, we mainly focus on Uganda. And then to empirically analyze the role of population pressure and rural to rural migrations. Uh, rural to rural migration is more uh, inter-community. This is different from the commonly researched rural urban migration. And then we, uh, we also intend to examine uh, whether the evolution of land institutions affect uh, land markets and agricultural productivity. Just to take you briefly through uh, the context in Uganda. Uganda is a very heterogeneous country ethnically diverse, around 53 tribes. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of what Uganda, the, the, the size of Uganda, it's around 247 uh, square kilometers, equivalent to Oregon State in the United States, one of the smallest states. So finding 53 tribes in such a small country, it, it shows how heterogeneous it is. Then more than 80% of land is under customary land tenure arrangement. Uh, and then uh, under this, it's mainly communal or individual customary. One of the studies shows that now it can be categorized into two. So you have private customary, meaning that they have no titles, but individuals have rights to sell their land. They can do anything with their land, even though it's not formal. They don't have uh, formal uh, rights. Then 73% of the population is, uh, under, is employed in agriculture. Then over three decades or so, the country has uh, experienced high population explosion, and currently the population growth rate is at 2.52, second in the world, and more than 60% of the population is below 18 years. So you have this, it's the youngest country in the world. So then you have this high population growth rate, land is uh, increasingly becoming scarce, 
And then initially, population was concentrated in some areas that were convenient and habitable. For example, the high altitude areas where mosquitoes were, like incidence of malaria was low. So then with this population explosion, you see people migrating from densely populated areas to sparsely populated areas. So we see these intercommunity migrations. As some anthropological studies uh, show that. So we use these uh, movements. We want to look at the impact of these movements on the evolution of the institutions, as I described before. And the data we use is a, a long panel uh, collected by National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Japan, who are together with Makere University. Uh, it has four rounds. Uh, it's a panel with so far uh, four rounds, covers 94 communities in the entire Uganda, apart from the northern region, because at the time this study started in 2003, there was a uh, war in northern Uganda. Then the panel captured land tenure arrangements since uh, 2003. Then in 12, uh, 2012, we enlisted information on uh, the now ethnic diversity in communities, uh, the number of, tribes, uh, number of tribes and the proportion of immigrants in each community, and we use this information. Uh, we also collect more, uh, we capture social economic variables and production uh, variables. So just to look at the statistics of whether institutions are evolving. Uh, looking at private land ownership, uh, private and customary, this is still rather private and communal, this is still under customary. So these are still informal institutions, only that we see a switch from communal ownership to private ownership, but this is uh, not titled land. So then you see from 2003, there has been a steady decline, uh, increase rather, of parcels that are privately owned from 40% to 56% uh, by 2013. And then those that are communally owned have steadily declined uh, from 46% to 25%. And that trend is increasing over time, uh, is consistent over time. Other tenure arrangements haven't changed. We don't see a systematic change in other tenure arrangements. So there are four main tenure arrangements in Uganda. We have customary, freehold. Freehold is mainly titles and registered land. You have Milo that came out because of colonialists who gave part of land to uh, chiefs, and so it's a different tenor arrangement. It has a different story altogether. And then we have leasehold and public land. Uh, land is getting more fragmented, so you see parcels held by each household, uh, per household are uh, increasing over time, so that is land fragmentation. Uh, to go in, more into, for exposition, we divide our communities, total communities, these are 94 communities, into sending and receiving communities. Uh, so sending, it means if we find that the proportion of current generation and past generation immigrants is uh, less than 3%, we, we call it sending. And it's receiving if at least 30% uh, of the current or past generation are immigrants. So we just do that to see the characteristic, to characterize both communities. So in terms of number of tribes, there are many tribes uh, more than twice in receiving communities. And then the proportion of immigrants, more than 50% of current generation uh, inhabitants in migrated. This one is less than 10% through for both past and current generation. And this is 40% and 52% uh, for both past and, uh, and current generation. Uh, still on the same, looking at uh, sending and receiving communities, uh, Product, this is yield. Yield doesn't seem to, to vary between the two communities. However, the modes of uh, uh, land tenure acquisition, more land is purchased and rented in in receiving communities, and the main mode of acquisition here is inheritance in, uh, in sending communities. And then for tenure arrangements, here it is more of private ownership and more of customary ownership, like communal ownership, uh, dominates in sending communities and private uh, dominates here in receiving communities. Uh, for the empirical specification, I just want to take you through briefly through this simple conceptual uh, framework uh, on how we think on how we think population density 
and rural to rural migration leads to uh, evolution or change of tenure arrangements from communal to private. One, it's the population density or population explosion, like I said, increases land scarcity, which uh, leads to the need for investment in land and then land transactions, and this all leads to the demand for private uh, rights. And then also it can as well work through rural to rural migration. For high population density, people start flowing from densely populated to uh, sparsely populated communities, and then you have ethnic diversity in those receiving communities, which weakens the informal land institutions that are in host communities that later translates into the demand for, because communal ownership cannot be sustained once you have 10 tribes in one community. And then that leads to the demand for uh, private uh, rights or property rights. Then our hypothesis, we expect to find that more ethnically diverse communities have high proportion, uh, those with higher proportion of immigrants uh, should have higher incidence of privately owned uh, parcels. And then at household level, we expect that parcels operated by immigrants have a higher uh, likelihood of being privately owned than those operated by indigenous uh, inhabitants. And then, yeah, we expect to find more privately owned parcels in, uh, uh, in densely populated areas. And then, in terms of yield, because we expect to uh, find more yield, like private ownership encourages land transactions, uh, investment in land, then we expect to find more yield in uh, these communities. I want to go through the specifications. Let me run to the results. Maybe just say something about specifications. There is one threat. If we say that proportion of immigrants uh, affects private uh, ownership, it could be that we have reverse causality. In other words, communities that have better institutions attract immigrants. So we again, we, we have, a, we construct a, a, an instrument for this. So we instrument this by, uh, it was a natural uh, phenomenon that happened where one district was wiped out by sleeping sickness of uh, more than 100 years ago, that is in 19, uh, 1898. And then you have over 50 years, you have this place unoccupied. And from 1956, people start flocking into that area. So the identification assumption is uh, the uh, occurrence of sleeping sickness was exogenous to the existing tenor arrangements. And then we use that as an instrument, as I'll be showing in the results shortly. I think the time, time is not on my side. Let me run to the results. Uh, results we find that pro uh, as the proportion of immigrants in a community increase, the likelihood of uh, having a, of a parcel being privately owned increases by uh, more than 10%. And then the number of tribes, because this is almost the same, so number of tribes also uh, increases the likelihood of privately owning land. And then we also use whether a household is indigenous or it migrated into a community. And it has uh, the other, so if you're a native, you are likely to uh, uh, hold land as a, a community. Putting the same variables in the same specification, results are still robust. Now here using the instance of sleeping sickness as an instrument, uh, results are still robust. And uh, we also check for the instrument, the variety of instruments, and it's varied. Then we go to land transactions. Rather, yeah, land transactions. We find that communities that have more immigrants are as the proportion of immigrants increase in a community, inheritance is likely to be uh, the mode of acquisition. But purchasing land and renting land is likely to be, yeah, the likelihood of uh, renting and purchasing land increases. And this uh, remains robust even when we only run those regressions for indigenous households. Because one of the concern would be that if we, an immigrant has only option of purchasing or renting land, but how about if we do it for only indigenous households? We also find these results still robust. Uh, on productivity, we find that uh, private ownership increases yield, uh, robust even when we control for community and seasonal fixed effects. And then we also check for efficiency, where we interact, uh, there is this inverse relationship uh, highly written about, so we also interact uh, private ownership and log of farm size, and you actually find that uh, when you interact for privately owned land, that inverse relationship doesn't uh, show up, but it shows up for communally owned land. 
So as a whole, inverse relationship is observed, but once we interact for privately owned parcels, there is no that inverse relationship, suggesting that probably it increases uh, efficiency. So I'm done. The policy implications is, yeah, private land ownership enhances pro, uh, agriculture productivity, uh, could be through investment and land transactions, but also uh, institutions are evolving. We find that institutions are evolving in response to internal migrations and population pressure. So maybe one that could, I have a, a, just a caution on this. I don't want to rush to say that a program should be maybe put in place to encourage people to migrate from one community to another because in my other paper, we find that those host communities have higher incidence of land conflicts because when these informal institutions collapse and the government doesn't put in place formal and strong institutions, what happens here is you don't have any adjudicating laws, you don't have anything like conflict resolution mechanisms, so land conflicts increase in these communities. Thank you. Well, thank you, Francis, for your presentation. I have to say that it's an incredibly interesting paper and also very well written, so congratulations. And uh, it's, well, it's about land tenure in, in Uganda and it's also extremely salient. Uh, currently, Uganda is uh, living a, a dual system. You have customary uh, land tenure and you have formal or private land tenure. And uh, actually, some uh, data argues that over 90% of disputes uh, in Uganda are about uh, land conflict. So this is actually a major issue in Uganda. Uh, another reason why this is salient is that economic growth in Uganda, which has been uh, relatively strong in the past 20 years, has not been matched by increased agricultural productivity. So every increase in production that has been taking place in the last 10 years has been uh, happening thanks to the expansion of cultivated land. However, Population density in the same period has increased by 34% according to the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. So we are reaching the point where intensifying a production is the only option uh, available. And then your analysis becomes very important. So the three main findings uh, are, well, first of all, there's a, there's, a, there's a correlation between ethnic diversity, immigration, and private ownership. You're not the first one to find this, but you're the first one to find this, uh, to use this instrument to use this, uh, this natural experiment of the sleeping, uh, sleeping uh, disease in, uh, in an area of Uganda to instrument for, uh, for in-migration. And you show that the, re the results are, are very robust. So this is actually a brilliant uh, strategy that you, that you followed. You also show that immigration uh, is strongly correlated with land, ac land acquisition modes. You show that the more immigrants are in a community, the less likely people are to inherit land and the more likely they are to purchase land. Well, of course, you understand immediately that an immigrant is very unlikely to inherit land to a certain community. So what you do is, well, this is strong and robust to looking only at indigenous households. And you're, then you argue, well, this means that immigrants actually foster sort of uh, an endogenous change in, uh, in, the, in the land tenure mechanism at the community level. And then third, you look at the relationship between private ownership of land and, and higher yield. So I think you, it's very nice that you look at the complete picture. Uh, there are some issues for discussion. First of all, you define receiving and sending communities, and then you put this threshold, 30%. So if, if more than 30% of the people in the community have migrated in the community in the last two generations, you call that a receiving community. If less or equal to 30% migrated. So this sounds rather arbitrary, and I know that you have good reasons for it, and you mentioned them very weakly but in the paper, but I think you should stress a bit more, because otherwise it's, it's, it may seem like you just uh, put this threshold because it was, it was the more convenient one. Uh, you look at the presence of tarmac roads, uh, that's very good, perhaps distance from Kampala and other spatial effects. Uh, it could be, well, Kampala is sort of this, this monster there in the middle of Uganda that has very different institutions and very different customs than the rest of the country, strongly urban, so even rural communities in the surrounding. I know you, you completely omit um, the Buganda, but, uh, but still you, you, you may want to control for, for that. Then let, about the coefficients of your, instru for, of your instrumental variable uh, uh, specification, you show that there's a 57% increase 
in private property, uh, so, and, and, you, and you read it this way, a 0 0.8 increase in the proportion of immigrants increases the, uh, by 46% the prevalence of private uh, property. So a bit more uh, explanation about what you mean by those coefficients, and that coefficient, 46%, is very different from, so the instrumental variable coefficient is massively bigger than, than any other OLS specification that you have, so look a little bit into that. And this is, I think, my most important uh, uh, issue for discussion. Uh, you, you have two, the, the two main find, sorry, then I'll stop with this one. The two main findings are that you find a correlation between ethnic diversity and immigration and private property. But later on, you show actually that this may be very strongly endogenous because you show that there's more immigration in communities where indigenous people have, have more uh, selling and purchase of land. So why don't you switch those two findings around in which you first show that, that there is this relationship and then you use your, your very brilliant uh, IV estimate using the CP sequence to, sh to show that actually this is, there is a causal relationship between immigration and, uh, and private property. Maybe we can discuss about this a bit later and also about the other points. Francisco, thank you for those interesting uh, questions. Uh, one, number one question was on that arbitrary figure of 30%. Yeah, maybe one thing I should first say that the definition of one, uh, whether 3%, 30% or 0% uh, doesn't affect my results because this was more statistics. I just, for exposition, to look at sending and receiving sure, communities. Exactly. But when it comes to reanalysis, I use this continuous really? variable. But then the reason we use that, we found that because when you come to a community, you ask uh, the proportion of immigrants, past generation, current generation, and someone will tell you 2%. But actually, you realize that even same setting, someone migrates from here to here, it is still migration. So to cater for that, we are like, if we, we are that restrictive and we take 0%, then you are considering people who are still in the same setting, affected by same institutions that even those minor migrations don't affect or don't change the tenor arrangements. That's why we are detrailed to set 30% for don't, don't call it sending, call it low in migration, high in migration, right? Because sending okay. refers to sending, this is... Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, we could uh, change that, thank you. Then uh, the second one was on the distance to Kampala. We use district six effects, so real distance to, district to Kampala, rather distance to Kampala may not, yeah, the, yeah, because we have this regional damage that we control for, right. so it's within the region uh, fixed effects. Uh, then the other one was the coefficient, this large coefficient, uh, on how we get it. Actually, we get that 0 0.8 by taking the difference between uh, sending and receiving community. So if you found, say, there are 52 percent, uh, the total, when you add the current generation and past generation, and then you add the receiving, then you take the totals, you, the, the difference between the totals was 0 0.8. So we multiply that uh, with the coefficient that we get. That's how we get the percentage that I put in the paper. Sorry, it wasn't uh, no, that it was clear. Why 0 .6 that it was higher. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we had uh, two issues were involved uh, with that. First of all, I think it was more of uh, the samples we had. In, we had issues with the samples in areas that were affected by sleeping sickness. And the other thing uh, was uh, the, our first results were thinking they were downward biased because once you have the co coexistence of both former and informal institutions uh, in receiving communities, then you have this, uh, the former institutions are rather pulling down the effects. So we were thinking it was, before it was downwardly biased and this shows the clear picture. However, it is subject to discussion. Uh, thank you and I think I'll talk to you more uh, about other questions. So, questions? Just a small question. Yes. It struck me that the coefficient of, of uh, population density was consistently negative. Yes. And there's an older set of theories which argues that with increasing density, communal land tenure systems become unsustainable. Right. And you say nothing about this negative coefficient. Right. Could you? Right. Could you answer that? Yeah, thank you. Very interesting observation. Uh, what we found, there was uh, one issue we found in the field. 
So you have sending communities from our discussion that are highly densely populated, but with strong communal set, uh, institutions. So this was reflecting more of a correlation rather than a causality. So then you find it consistently, like if when you run regression, you have sending communities, highly populated, but uh, homogeneous because they were the areas that were that had uh, that sent immigrants out and they retained their informal institutions so then we think population density works through actually in my uh, I can't go back to the results but what I, we find in our results is population density uh, highly explains out migration so it works through influencing migrations to change the tenure arrangements but itself may not change the tenure arrangements that's why the highly densely populated areas have uh, remained, you know, with this, the social capital is strong, social cohesion, they are neat there, you know, they are still neat. So we don't have this uh, evolution taking place in those institutions. Any other question? Yeah, thanks. It's about the exclusion restriction of your instrument. So, um, using this sleeping sickness, I guess that there are many effects of this sickness that could explain why you found your um, result. And so, I, it's hard for me to believe that the only channel that the sickness operates through is actually uh, migration. I mean, the fact that you have a sickness, people dying, you have fewer people cultivating the land, the land stays fallow for a much longer time, it becomes much more productive, and so it's much more rentable to have other type of contracts. And so you create other type of contracts. And there's nothing to do with actual migration. And then even in migration, if I believe your story, there is a strong selection into migration. We know that it's not random who decides to migrate and who exactly. decides to stay. Right. So there can be a, a selection of people moving there and having different preferences for different contracts. Right. So still, um, yeah, I would like you to explain a bit more your exclusion the restriction instrument. of the instrument. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Interesting question. The reason we use the, first of all, our identifying uh, education assumption is the occurrence of sleeping sickness was exogenous to the existing tenor arrangements. So if we think that, because we know that 100 years ago, all the whole of Uganda, tenor arrangements were purely communal. So if we had this sleeping sickness affecting one community and rendering it you know, inhabitable, no one is there, and then people who come uh, from different tribes form these form institutions. And where they were coming from, they left communal institutions. Because like you say, they self-selection. But if you are under a communal setting, and when you come, you establish uh, a private ownership, then I don't know how I can explain that. Because if it was self-selection, maybe People that previously held private land may come and bring with them this technology or this new innovation of private arrangements. But these are guys who owned communal, uh, their land communally before, and when they come, they now come, uh, they formulate. That's just because migration. Mm. There are many other things. Whereas when you do the history, Such as. Uh, well, because the fact that the land was not cultivated for a long time. Right. And so a land that has not been cultivated for a long time becomes more productive maybe in the longer term. Right. And so it is then more rational maybe to have different type of contracts, you see? Mm -hmm. So it's not that the sickness just affects migration, it affects many other things most likely. And so this is not the only channel. Right. Yeah, so uh, I agree with you that uh, sleeping sickness, of course, if it renders uh, land unused, then the land becomes more productive and we know that this, people want to secure land that is highly productive. However, in our analysis, we use uh, indigenous or the native dame, where we show that if someone in the same community, because there were some remnants, if we find someone in the same community is indigenous and still holds land as a communal, but it's only in migrants who own it privately, then maybe that argument may not work that much. Because if everyone holds it privately, the argument would be, yes, the entire land, the whole community is productive, so everyone in there wants to secure it. But then you have indigenous people one, uh, owning it communally, and it's only immigrants. So then, yeah, th that's why we thought probably that may not be a huge uh, like, concern. Yeah. 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 Y
but uh, I get what you're saying. Probably we may want to look more into that. Yes. Yes, please. Well, um, good afternoon. This paper uh, is logically connected to the previous stuff. And Francesco is one of my uh, co-authors here on this paper, as is Jan Dukostad. So this is also about the interface between formal and informal institutions. So it touches on the first uh, paper that was discussed. And it's also about Uganda, voila. So I'll be talking about, uh, indeed this issue, this issue of Expanding formal institutions, how, how does this affect existing informal ones? And I will sort of sloppily proxy for informal institutions or one specific dimension of that by a measure of social capital. So these expanding formal institutions, we find them in ver uh, various uh, domains, uh, value chains, titles, judicial systems, we talked about some of this uh, already. And the question of course is more in general, do we believe that formal and informal institutions are complements or substitutes in, uh, in development. So the particular case that we, uh, that we focus on here is uh, health insurance. Uh, I, I think across the board in many countries we see uh, formal insurance opportunities uh, expanding uh, the choice set for potential customers, potentially because of uh, innovations in communication technology and also because new products have been developed, right? Especially uh, index insurance, rain-based index insurance, etc. We see quite a bit of that. So we ask whether this expansion or access to formal health insurance, whether that affects social capital or the ability of local communities to coordinate on co cooperative outcomes. And the particular inter interpretation that I try to uh, sell to you here is that social capital sort of proxies for informal sharing or redistribution systems that existed before, right? So you can think about formal insurance then as a, really as a substitute mechanism for providing care for people who, uh, who, uh, who need it. But I should also warn you that there's really no firm empirical basis for this particular interpretation. So just see whether you believe that or not. So some other work uh, over the past few years have looked at the impact of formal insurance on sharing arrangements. Um, and you'll see that our work is consistent with these findings, but also adds a novel dimension to this. So in the paper is a very simple theoretical model. I don't want to uh, dwell upon here too much. It just builds on uh, 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 earlier work by Rebellion and others where you say, well, uh, we can think about informal sharing as partially motivated by expected reciprocity. Right. So, in the context of repeated interaction, uh, we can think about self-enforcing arrangements. We should make sure then that the short-term temptation to renege on the uh, obligation to help somebody else does not outweigh, does not dominate the, uh, the benefits from long-term uh, cooperation. And then in that simple model, in the, essentially just a few equations, we ask what happens if we introduce formal insurance, which is just one way to improve the autarky position of, of, of individuals in a network, right? Now opting out of the network really is not such a big deal because you don't have to rely on others. Like models based on storage or re flows of remittances, formal insurance essentially improves the autarky position, which really affects the participation constraints, which affect the amount of informal sharing that can be supported as, a, uh, as an equilibrium. An unambiguous prediction is that non-adopters of insurance, so if you think about a network of individuals and then some non-random share of people in that network presumably adopts formal insurance, the non-adopters, those who are left behind, are then unambiguously worse off, right? Because their ability to smooth consumption through transfers will deteriorate. And one question that I would like to ask to you now is that 
how do we think these people will respond to this outcome, right? Uh, when we think about formal and informal insurance and we think about them as substitutes or complements or whatever, then we are prone to focus on the uh, incentives or the perspective of those potentially adopting. But what, what about those left behind, right? And uh, even though we did not write a pre-analysis plan, maybe we should have done that, Francisco, even b before we analyzed the data, we talked about this, partly motivated by a book by James Scott called The Weapons of the Week, which is about mechanization in Malaysia. And what is de demonstrated by this anthropologist in Malaysia is that the process of mechanization really benefited a small group of people in communities. Think about those as the adopters, perhaps, in an insurance system. But it really did not help the majority of the people who uh, suddenly found that the demand for their labor went down and they were marginalized across the board. How did these people respond to that? Well, they responded, says Scott, by denying cooperation in all sorts of other spheres of interaction, right? So we were explicitly interested in asking, do we observe the same in this context? So we look at a very small scale insurance intervention. This is not a uh, randomized control, uh, control trial. And uh, an NGO is rolling out this program, not in a random fashion, they say it's arbitrary, you don't target specific communities and they expect to roll out into other uh, parishes in the future. Uh, so when we look at the, uh, at the data that we've collected, indeed we find, and these, this, these are the observables that we have, there's really not much in terms of differences in, uh, uh, between control and treated communities. The only thing here that's significant is age of the household head. So that's about three and a half years. No big deal, we think. So what happens in, in, the, in the communities that now have gained access to an insurance product offered by that NGO is that households will have to pay a premium, the equivalent of about $10 per year. In return, they receive a card and then they gain access to a range of, uh, a, a range of uh, care products with contracted facilities. So in the villages where this form of insurance came available, the great majority of the people, 95% of the villages, had heard about this. Half of them had subscribed, but, but, but uh, uh, only a, a minority had managed to pay the full premium by the time we collected our data. Which is somewhat interesting from our perspective because it suggests that many of those people have one foot, if you like, in the formal system, but currently, if you have not paid the full premium yet, you still don't qualify for care, right? So in the meantime, while you may be trying to scrape the funds together to pay the rest, you still need to rely on your social network to provide the type of care that you need. So what we will do is we will compare the behavior in a very simple lab game of villages with access to insurance with, uh, villages, in uh, uh, with villages where that access is not yet available. So we will compare behavior across villages, doing some sort of intention to treat uh, effect, uh, uh, because we will be lumping together both the adopters and the non-adopters. But then in the more interesting part of the paper, or, or so I hope, we will actually try to tease that apart and see, okay, if there is a difference between treated and controlled villages, who, what group of people is is, dri is driving that difference? Is it the adopters who are opting out of the network or is it the non-adopters who are unhappy about, uh, about the way things have uh, developed in recent years? And our dependent variable, so this is our proxy for social capital, which is uh, 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 what we do is we play a simple public good game with N villagers anonymously um, and then we measure contributions to the public good as a proxy for uh, public mindedness and the, the willingness to, uh, to, to advance local or to provide local public goods. So we ask, do people contrib contribute less if they have access to alternative insurance opportunities? And we ask, who does contribute less? So these are the research questions that we then uh, uh, try to address. Are wealthy households more likely to pick up health insurance than poor ones? I mean, that would be the obvious starting point, uh, given that the, the premium of $10 um, is, is not marginal for uh, many households in our sample. And then we ask, is access 
uh, of, uh, to formal insurance associated with lower average contributions to the public goods in a, a, a public goods game, where we look at both the, uh, uh, the, uh, the contributions to the pot, but also to the share of people in the group or in the village that makes a, a high donation, either four or five tokens. So here we have a wealth index based on asset ownership and we have a poverty proxy. And then these are the, the, the two other questions that we try to uh, uh, address. Assuming that the introduction of formal insurance is associated with reduced aggregate <coughs> contribution to the common, put, uh, common pot, who is responsible for these lower contributions? Should we blame or the adopters or the non-adopters, or maybe both? Right? So we try to explain uh, um, uh, the, the share of high contributors and, uh, and contributions to the pot by the adoption status or the non-adoption status of the villagers, where the, uh, uh, the omitted category here are the respondents who, who, who do not have access yet. Of course, there's all sorts of selection issues going on, right? So we try to control for that. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We try to control for that and we ask, do predicted non-adopters with access to foreign insurance behave the same as predicted non-adopters without access? So what we do here now is we look at the sample of villages with access to formal insurance, we try to explain who, who adopts, and then based on the coefficients of that model, we return to the sample of villages where uh, the formal insurance opportunity is not yet available, and then we and then we predict and then we predict for each and every individual household in our sample whether or not they are likely to uh, uh, to adopt insurance when that becomes available in the future. So what we do is we then estimate this model where we uh, ex uh, again explain uh, uh, contributions, etc., by the predicted probability of adoption, but we also do a propensity score matching where we do nearest neighbor matching uh, um, across the two types of, uh, of villages. So the first question is, uh, do wealthy households, are they more likely to adopt? And of course they are. Right? It would have been awkward if it was not the case. So our wealth index uh, uh, enters significantly non-linearly, but when we throw out uh, two outliers, it, it, it's just a linear thing. If we instead use a poverty dummy based on an alternative asset index, then we find the same. So poor households are 20% less likely to adopt formal health insurance, right? because it's not so cheap. Here, then, we look at sharing in the public goods game, or sharing, let's just call it donations, right, or investment in the public goods game. What we have here in villages where the formal insurance uh, opportunity is available, on average, uh, contributions of 0.3 uh, uh, tokens less, right, compared to the, uh, um, compared to the villages where formal health insurance is not available. When we then try to distinguish be be just between the adoption status of individual villages, then we find that it's uh, the non-adopters who contribute less, right? It's not the adopters. Also distinguishing between full adopters and partial adopters, it doesn't matter. It's the people who have not adopted the health insurance who are dismayed about this new development, who in anecdotal evidence afterwards complain about how things have changed and it's, they're not sure where they should turn to now in case of trouble, these people start contributing less, right? Fully consistent with the James Scott story. Same story when we look at the, at, at the percentage of, sorry, of high contributors. Again, in villages where people have access to insurance, fewer people contribute four or five tokens to the public good. And again, this is explained by the non-adopters. So the pre uh, here then we try to somehow finesse the selection issue a little bit, right? So this is with the predicted non-adopters and here we have the propensity score matching models. The results across the board stay the same. It is the predicted non-adopters and it is the non-adopters with access in the PSM model that contribute less, right? Predicted non-adopters are less likely to contribute much to the common pot unless they live uh, in non-access villages because that is an interesting thing. In the no-access villages, we find that the predicted non-adopters actually contribute more to the pot, right? So it's not an income effect. 
we're not picking up something else. So when we, when we use the uh, coefficients of, uh, of essentially this probit model to explain whether households will adopt uh, formal insurance in, in other villages, we'll find that in the villages where, the, where, where health insurance is not yet available, the relatively poor contribute more. So this is my final slide, right? So the up, is it? Yes, it is. So the uptake of insurance is far from uniform, obviously. The relatively wealthy are more likely to enter, and the poor, they deplore this development, right? Sport, the, the, whole, the whole, we didn't, I think we could have done a better job more systematically collecting these types of anecdotes, but there's quite a few in the exit interviews, people saying stuff like, well, this scheme spoils the care for those who can't pay for the scheme. We're unhappy about this. So the average contributions to the common pot are lower in villages with access to insurance. But it's not the insured who contribute less, right? So it, maybe it's too naive to think about this in terms of the simple substitution effect. People now have access to formal insurance and therefore they, they draw out of the network. They're saying, you, you guys, you're on your own. That's, that's, that is not what we pick up in this experiment. People contribute as much uh, as, the, uh, as, the, as their counterparts in no access villages. It seems to be the non-adopters who use this game to signal their dismay to their fellow villagers, which is consistent with that anthropological evidence. Admittedly, of course, identification here is rather rough, and I glossed over some of the nasty details. This is not a nice and tidy RCT, but we can actually do a little bit more, and uh, Francesco, I think, ha ha has already been able to collect additional data that would at least enable a diff and diff type of panel approach to more cleanly identify these effects, but that will have to wait. Thank you very much. Uh, reading the paper and it was a nice presentation. I really enjoyed uh, how you attempted to, to really find the, the causal impact, you know, predicting the likely adapters and non-adapters and using that later in your robustness checks. It was really interesting and I would say it's well written and it was nice reading. However, all my comments will be mainly related to whether what you find actually explains uh, the deviation from the informal institutions, specifically, because uh, as you will be seeing later in my comments. But another view of what they, they try to do in, in their paper is to explore how the introduction of formal insurance affects the within village dynamics of social capital. And the main general hypothesis is formal insurance crowds out uh, informal communal arrangements. And authors set out to test two main theories, and one is from the economic perspective of this substitution. Formal insurance provides a substitute to informal arrangements. Therefore, we expect to see those who uh, benefit from formal insurance pulling out from form, uh, informal arrangements. Uh, the second uh, theory is uh, from anthropological perspective on social embeddedness, that those that are left behind punish by pulling out uh, uh, of the informal arrangements, and their results support the second uh, theory. So my comments, and like I said, they are all on whether what you find actually depict uh, or show a movement from informal uh, institutions, or we are getting something different. So that, those are my comments, and the first one is, uh, that there are many determinants of informal institution arrangements and all, not only insurance. Uh, so first of all, we don't know. It's a function. Participating in an informal arrangement is a function of several factors. There is this sudden death. There are weather, uh, weather shocks. So really, if you pull out uh, this one component, would that make people deviate? So, and I understand your problem. You didn't have the prior information on the arrangements to know what people uh, actually 
what those informal arrangements are for or what they take care of. So, but this would be interesting to find out what, if this proportion or contribution of informal or rather of insurance is minute compared to the other uh, factors that these people form these groups, then pulling out or giving formal insurance may not affect this. Uh, so we don't know uh, the proportion attributed to that. And then in rural Uganda, even including in those control communities, people are already involved in some other formal arrangements. For example, people get formal credit from banks, and they still remain in their informal uh, arrangements. Uh, people, there are many interventions, there are many NGOs in local communities, even in, the, in your control areas. So why is it that these other interventions haven't made people pull out its own informal insurance that is making people pull out of these informal arrangements? So I think you really need to dig deep, uh, deeper into that to, read, uh, to convince people that actually it's uh, the, 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 this that causes the deviation. Uh, so like, and like you said, 53% had subscribed and only 18% of those that subscribed had fully paid uh, the yearly premium. That is around 9% of the entire uh, group. And that's still a small proportion to really cause this unravel, uh, unraveling of uh, what you find of the informal arrangements. The second one, yeah, again, you didn't have prayer data. Maybe you can do this uh, in your next uh, study. Uh, we didn't know the, what existed before. So we don't know the movement from where to where. While, while there are differences between informal, okay, the kind of informal structures between the, other, the treated communities and the controls in that case, uh, and then the other one you show economic attributes, where wealth factor as the main determinant of this. But there are social uh, attributes that you didn't, you didn't look at, especially uh, ethnic diversity in those communities. Chitagata, I know, is uh, one area where there are hot, hot springs. And probably with that area could have attracted immigrants in those communities that were treated. And if that is the case, it could be that even before the intervention, there were no inform strong informal mechanisms in, that, uh, in those areas that were treated. So then we need to know the social factors underlying all this. Uh, it's time we can discuss the more, uh, I still had more two comments, but we can discuss them uh, later. Thank you. Let me, let me very quickly uh, respond to these two issues and then we can open up and see if there's addi additional concerns. I, I fully accept this comment, right? That our particular interpre interpretation doesn't really have a strong empirical basis. Um, I was going to say, uh, and maybe I should have spent more time discussing this, the four or five other papers that I quickly flashed as, let's say, the uh, intellect intellectual legacy on which we uh, build here, they, uh, mo most of them look at sharing amounts. So actually they don't, they don't play a game, they, they, they look at transfers within the network. So we wanted to do something that was a little bit differently. But they do document that for the, for, for the, for the things that they study, that sharing patterns are also affected by uh, uh, formal insurance. And there's a, a one paper here that I haven't mentioned. It's a, a paper by uh, Morton on remittances and uh, uh, remittances and, sh and sharing. And you, you ask, why just this? Why, why not all these other things? Well, she documented that indeed flows of remittances also affect the participation of people into networks and their sharing behavior. So it could well be that even though I, I fully agree that this particular insurance intervention is relatively unimportant, when I look at the literature and I look at other types of interventions that theoretically should have similar effects, we also observe these similar effects, right? So this is just one, this is one uh, of the, uh, the one element of, of, a, of, of a bigger story. And I don't want to blow this uh, out of proportion by saying this is the most important thing and this is, this is explaining the, the unraveling of villages. That's clearly not what we, uh, uh, what we observe, right? We observe that people on average contribute less to the public good. Our interpretation of this is in terms of being able to provide a uh, local public good. And then we prefer to, 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 to sort of interpret this, look at this 
through the lens of a sharing network, but uh, I agree that this is open to debate, right? Because we, as I said, we don't have those data. And this point is well taken, right? So in, in, indeed, uh, even though in terms of our observables, uh, we didn't document any uh, 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 other than the age, we, we didn't document any differences. Um, it, it's, it's possible that we have omitted or that it's unobservables, right, that, that are important. So from that perspective, I think that the, uh, the, the diff and diff approach that we can hopefully turn to later in the spring will be uh, better able to convince you. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate um, a bit more about the interpretation of the public goods scheme. Right. The reason I ask is that given that the public goods scheme is uh, anonymous, um, I I'm not sure how, um, uh, how it's connected to our willingness to participate in an informal insurance network, how it uh, measures that and so on. That is tenuous. And in the current write-up, the version of the paper that you have seen, we. Uh, we, we emphasize this, but I, I, don't, I don't really think that we can defend this. So we will, have to, we will have to step back a little bit. And what we really have in mind is more something like the, the, the Fearon et al. type of study. Maybe you've seen that. So there was this short paper in the AER. There's another, another one came out in the American Political Science Review where they treat this just as a, a proxy for social capital in general. So the ability to the ability to provide public goods because this is somehow, I mean, it's, it's picking up different things, right? It's a little bit of altruism, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, an expectation that other will do the same. All those, or a, a couple of perspectives that I, I think are all associated with measures of cognitive social capital. And then the, and then the insurance perspective is really our thing for whatever that's worth. And I think, uh, uh, I think we, we, we should be a little bit more careful. But yeah, we, di we discussed this. Um, a clarification. So um, couldn't it just be that um, people are perfectly coherent with their own preferences and so adopters are very happy to adopt an insurance scheme and are also very happy to contribute to yeah. public goods and known adopters do not adopt on the whole range of possibilities, so they don't adopt insurance scheme and they're also not happy about contributing to the public scheme. And so uh, I was wondering about the second comment, but do you actually have information whether there are uh, informal arrangements between adopters and non-adopters? Not systematically. Okay. No. So it could be just a matter of preferences, right? Yeah, so we, we'll try, we, we try to somehow capture that through the uh, propensity score matching exercise, right? So we try to compare like with like, nearest neighbor matching, where we say based on observables. I mean, if, if you're pointing to some sort of an unobservable, and which, which makes the, the matching go wrong, then this, this could be true, right? But also, on average, I don't think a priori is any reason to believe that the share of people who are unhappy to contribute to the public good should be happy, should be larger in the no excess villages, right? So when we just look at the intention to treat effect, we already document a difference. So at the aggregate level, something, something has happened. Um, a puzzling thing, if you like, is that if, if you believe the, uh, if you believe the James Cobb perspective, uh, and he studied Malaysia for uh, this one village in Malaysia f for I think five years or maybe even longer. So what he documents is, is really a long-term unraveling of social capital and social relations. And uh, at, at end, almost two groups uh, at loggerheads. When you look at the way our adopters behave, we don't find anything like that, right? The, the, contrib the, the adopters contribute as much to the pot as their counterparts in other villages. So you could ask, why are the non-adopters so upset? Nothing has happened yet. And that, I would say, that's, uh, that's probably where we have to do a little bit of speculation. You could perhaps argue that, this, that the, uh, the, the partial and very incomplete adoption of uh, maybe a, a social upper layer, uh, as is happening now, sets the stage for more 
large-scale adoption and a full adoption of a larger group of people, and that the non-adopters just anticipate they know where this is going and they try to nip it in the bud. But that, I mean, that's just speculation, right? Because currently, uh, when you just look at our data stack, there is no reason for the non-adopters to be, to be upset and retaliate or send signals. But it seems to be what's going on. I'm happy to move on. So I'm going to be the last presenter today. So I'm going to present my work on the long run consequences of the villagization program in Tanzania. So um, a lot of countries implemented forced relocation programs in the 20th century, and Tanzania was one of those countries. And a lot of Tanzanians were affected by this program. And I'm trying to look at whether this program had a persistent legacy and uh, what, what, what is the legacy of that program. So here's the timeline of my study. So this program, to, so in 1967, Julius Nyerere, the president of Tanzania at the time, he announced, he made the Arusha Declaration, which was his vision of how, uh, his vision of uh, socialism applied to the Tanzanian context. And of that, a major component of that vision was Ujima, which was uh, in Ujima villages, which were basically villages, government villages where people would live together and work together. The program was voluntary at the beginning for the first couple of years, but the uptake of the program was pretty slow. So um, in 1973, Nyerere announced, he declared that it was an order to move to villages. And um, so the government machinery was used between 1973 and 75 to ramp up the program, the uptake of the program. And by, by the time the 1978 census was conducted, 78% of the population was living in a government designated village. So, so that, uh, the 1978 census, uh, so in, in that census I know what percentage of each district lived in government villages. So that is my treatment variable. And the outcome variable that I look at is from the household budget survey in 2011 and 12. So I basically model household, current household outcomes, uh, primarily consumption as a function of the district level measure of uh, the intensity of villagization. And a, my primary challenge is going to be um, uh, the, the fact that the, uh, this intensity of this program might be non-random. So I, I instrument the intensity of the program implementation by droughts within Tanzania, by the intensity of droughts within Tanzania during the, this period when, uh, during the period 1973 to 75, when the program was, when most of the implementation of the program happened. So, the, so I basically look at spatial variation within Tanzania during, uh, during, this, uh, during this period. So my main result is that villagization left a persistent and negative impact on economic outcomes. And I, I um, argue that retreat into agriculture might explain some of this, uh, this impact. So, this lit, uh, so the, the literature that my work uh, links to is the literature that um, says history matters in explaining differences in economic outcomes across countries and within, uh, within countries. And also the literature that argues that weather events matter in uh, the course of history, in determining the course of history. So you, you're probably aware of Russia and China as countries that implemented massive relocation programs, but sub, several other countries also implemented several programs. Ethiopia, Mozambique, uh, Mexico, Rwanda being the latest example in, in the 1990s, in the mid 90s after the genocide, they relocated about 20% of their population to planned villages. And um, in, there was a lot of interest in the Tanzanian experience in, in the 1980s, immediately after the, the program ended, but the interest slowly fell off until um, there, this paper in 2012 by Osafa Kwaku, who looked at the long-term impact of, of this program, and he focused primarily on social capital. And he found that, he, he finds that uh, districts that were heavily influenced by this, uh, were districts where this program was heavily implemented, um, they're actually, uh, so social capital is greater in those districts. And social capital, he defines social capital as community participation and uh, political awareness. So I build on his work 
by focusing on consumption, by household consumption. I also look at alternative measures of program imp implementation, different outcomes, and different data sets. And I argue that agriculture might be a channel of persistence. And I also improve on his um, instrumentation strategy. So I'll, next I'll tell you a little bit about the villagization program in Tanzania. So in 1967, immediately before this, this program was announced, uh, the population of Tanzania was predominantly rural. And 6% of the population lived in the urban areas, and half of that population was in Dar es Salaam. And not only was the population primarily was predominantly rural, it was also scattered throughout the country. And there have been several reasons given in the literature to explain why this happened. And uh, the quality of the soil in Tanzania being one reason. It's a humongous country. It's two and a half times the size of the UK. And also, um, because of slave, tra slave trade and colonization, there was a general sense of mistrust. So people just tried to avoid each other as much as possible. And um, when, so Tanzania became independent from the UK in, 1961, and in 1962, uh, um, that's, uh, in 1962, Nyerere, he announced um, his intention, his, his vision for development, and it was that if we want to develop, the first and absolutely essential thing to do is to begin living in proper villages. So he was educated in the UK, and he thought that development meant people would live in villages and in bigger communities. So that was his intention, and he announced, he made that announcement in 1967, so there were different stages of the villagization program. So in, um, in the first stage, 1967 to 72, was voluntary. So the goal was that people would live together and work together. And, and argue, the argument was that people, it, it would be good for everyone that people would live together and work together. It was voluntary, but the take-up was very low. So uh, he got a little impatient. So he changed his strategy in 1973. In 1973, he made the program mandatory. There was no law, but anything Mireya said was law at that time. And um, so he said, so he dropped the working together, together aspect. So he just emphasized the living together aspect. And in the next three years, between 1973 and 75, the entire government, government machinery was used to relocate people to government villages. And uh, by, by the end of 1975, the program was declared to be complete. But, uh, and and um, in the 1978 census, uh, so the program basically trailed off after 1975. Uh, in the late 70s, Tanzania got into a war with uh, Uganda, and things um, just um, um, went on a downward spiral after that. And the program was abandoned in 1982 when the law recognizing uh, government villages with, was withdrawn. So, so, um, so I'll, I have a few Im images next. So there is near area right in the center. Um, this is in uh, the early 70s where he's trying to where he's traveling around the country, trying to um, galvanize, trying to uh, generate interest in uh, the, this program. So this is a schematic diagram of how villagization happened. So people would basically, for example, in this area, uh, so the, um, for example, the uh, military would show up in a truck in this area and say, you, you, and you, these, you are going to move to this government village a couple of miles from here. And then they would move to another area, they'd do the same thing, and then similarly they would move, up, move throughout the country and uh, throughout the uh, district. And, and this is basically how um, the government managed to uh, relocate people. This is an example of a um, Ujamaa village in the, in the early 1970s. You can see that the quality of housing was pretty poor, and people often got together and built these houses uh, amongst themselves, where they got a little bit of help from the government as well. So the data set that I use is from primarily from the Household Budget Survey um, that has about, in, uh, that was conducted in 2011-12. But, but I also use data from the National Panel Survey and I use the data from the uh, 1967 and 78 censuses too. The outcome measure that I look at is consumption, but I also look at asset index, income, education, and a bunch of other variables as well. So my primary dependent variable is the intensity of the program at the district level. So that basi that's basically the share of the district population that lived in government villages in the 1978 census. I also have an alternate measure of vi villagization where, um, where I look at uh, whether, where the question is whether this community was newly established in, um, in, during the villagization program. So I have a bunch of controls. Um, I have geographic controls, pre-villagization characteristics of districts in, 19, in the 1967 census, and uh, I also control for household characteristics in the household budget survey. 
So here are some summary statistics that I'll quickly skim through, but I'll, so the key variable here is uh, the outcome variable. So my outcome variable is um, log of per capita household consumption. And my primary dependent, primary independent variable is uh, the share of the district population living in govern, government villages in 1978. So I also control for a bunch of other district level variables um, and household controls. So the, the map on the left um, shows the intensity of the villagization program in, 19, um, in the 1978 census. And uh, the, this plot on the right basically captures my, primary, my main story. So this is a plot of log of uh, annual household per capita household consumption in 2011-12 as a function of the district level villagization in 1978. And we see a negative relationship between consumption now and villagization uh, in 1978. And so my goal from now on is to see if this relationship holds after I throw a bunch of control variables and I, um, I address uh, the, uh, the endogeneity issue. So the first question is, was there a selection bias in the implementation of villagization? So what I do here is, so I look at, so I split all 95, 95 Tanzanian districts from the 1978 census into three groups by the intensity of villagization. So, and I look at pre-villagization characteristics. Um, uh, I compare the pre-villagization characteristics between those three, three groups. And I don't find any systematic difference between these three groups. So, um, so I look at a, very, a variety of characteristics that are related to demographics and to um, economic variables and also geography. So I, could, I also look at mean rainfall and the standard deviation of rainfall. And I don't find systematic differences between districts that were heavily uh, influenced by, that were, where uh, this program was heavily implemented and districts where it wasn't implemented. But this isn't sufficient. This alleviates a little, some concern about selection bias. Um, so my, um, this is my empirical strategy. So um, just remind you of my uh, timeline. So the, um, the villagization campaign was ramped up during 1973 and 75. So the census, my treatment variable is from the 1978 census and the outcome variable is from 2011 and 12. So um, this is my primary specification where my outcome variable is the log of per capita household consumption. Um, and beta one is my primary uh, uh, coefficient of interest, which is the, and X one is the district level intensity of villagization, villagization in the 1978 census. And I also have a bunch of other controls. Okay, so I estimate, um, I conducted my estimation using uh, OLS and IV, and my instrument for the district level intensity of villagization is sporadic droughts across Tanzania in during this period, 1973 and 75, when most of the villagization happened. Okay, so so this is my instrument. So my instrument is a Z score of rainfall in uh, at the district level during 1973 and 75, and droughts were often used as as a threat by the government, by by the government, by the mili military. Um, by the party officials to try to move people to government villages. So they would come to an area and they would say, if you want drought relief, you have to move to a government village. So it was used as a precondition to move people. And um, so, uh, so you can see that these 1973 to 75 were pretty low years of rainfall. These were below average years of rain rainfall. But there was also spatial variation within, um, within Tanzania in the intensity of the drought. So, and, and the spatial variation with, within Tanzania is, which, is what I exploit. So these are my results of, uh, these are my first stage results of IV. And uh, so column two is my primary uh, column of interest. So here we see that the Z score of rainfall during 1973 and 75 was a, a significant predictor of villagization um, in 1978. And I also, as, um, so my, art, so uh, I find that the uh, rainfall, these droughts only affected villagization during this narrow window of time when this program was ramped up, and, but not before or after this program happened. So these act as placebos in my case. So my exclusion restriction is that these droughts did, don't, didn't affect current consumption in 2011 and 12, other than through the, endogen, uh, other than through the endogenous variable. And, um, and I find, so th there is no way to uh, do this rigorously, but uh, the, best thing I can do is to run this reduced form model where 
Um, I run the, uh, the current uh, consumption as a function of a variety of variables, including the instrument. And if the instrument, and I, ideally the instrument should not be um, significant, which is what I find. So these are my main results. So here I find that uh, villagization uh, had, a had a persistent and negative impact on current consumption. And um, my, so, uh, so column one is my OLS uh, uh, results and column two through six are uh, my results, IB results for different subsamples. And um, I find that for the non Dar es Salaam sample, the rural subsample and the farming subsample, the result, this uh, relationship holds, but not for the urban subsample. So the, do, are these results robust? That's, that, would be your obvious, that would be the obvious question, right? So each, all of these coefficients come from separate regressions where I look at different, different outcome variables. So this is my primary result, consumption, but I also look at, I uh, trim the top 5% and the bottom 5% of the consumption distribution. I also look at income, asset index, education. I look at a different measure of villagization. And um, I also look at the National Panel Survey in addition to the Household Budget Survey. Uh, and I find that you can see that the results are predominantly uh, all negative and that, um, that villagization seems to have had a negative impact on a variety of outcomes. So the question is why? And I think it's the story is within agriculture. And um, there, there are stories that, that, there, the, that villagization program dealt a severe blow to agriculture in, um, during this program and it seems to have persisted. And um, so I look at, so here I look at the household labor shares in different activities in farming versus wage labor and self-employment. And I find that households living in these um, highly, uh, so these districts where villagization was intensely um, implemented, households are predominantly engaged in agriculture now. Um, and they're much less likely to be engaged in uh, wage labor or self-employment. So, so that so it seem, looks like villagization had an impact on current outcomes through the um, by sort of uh, getting households stuck in agriculture. And um, that's the story that I find. I'll skip the conclusion section because I'm out of time. Uh-huh. Well, this was, a, this was a, a pleasure to read. I thought it was a, 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 an interesting paper. It was really well written. Uh, deals with an interesting topic and it also fits, as you indicated, in this growing literature on uh, long-term effects of shocks or institutional reform, etc. So it's very timely. Um, I essentially have only three uh, topics to start the uh, the discussion, one about the instrument, one about the controls, and then uh, another one maybe we should talk about a little bit longer. First, uh, first my, 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 my potential concern about the instrument. So you use droughts in 73, 75 to instrument for villagization at the district level. I wonder to what extent this variable picks up that we're talking about drought prone areas, right? So you sort of check this by looking at the two years before and after this window and you say, well, nothing happens there. But it would perhaps be interesting to see whether in subsequent years, since the mid 1970s, if there have been droughts in Tanzania, whether it were these very same uh, villages that were affected because of districts that would have been affected because that could be an alternative channel that would explain why they are relatively bad off. And I think uh, just, looking at how droughts have evolved spatially over time would, would go a long way towards dealing with this issue. Second, when you look at the map of villagization in, in, in Tanzania, it, it's obvious that it's not random, right? And one of the, one of the things that, that comes up is that especially distance to commercial centers like Arusha and Dar es Salaam seems large, right? So. I wonder whether perhaps you could control for distance to these urban centers to uh, make the case that you have this 
propensity to engage in farming and other things that is indeed driven by the villagization and not just by the distance component, right? So if you, if you find this result controlling for distance to these commercial centers, I think that would make the result even more interesting. And my third question, and um, because I, I'm not, I don't have the number here, but I think, I think you just indicated that on average, 78% of the people lived in villages in the mid 1970s, right? So this was, a, this was a major intervention by the government, right, to pull this off. And that made me ask, what about the stable unit treatment value assumption? Or in other words, can we really assume that what happened here did leave the more control areas unaffected, right? In other words, did treatment status of high villagization districts affect the potential outcomes of the other districts? And I think in light of the effort, this must have happened, right? Villages were created, people were supported, markets were built up, people were taxed, resources were freed up by the government, part of which was spent somewhere else. So to, some, to conclude based on these data that villagization lowered consumption in Tanzania is really a leap of faith, right? Because everything that happened in Tanzania, this is such a major thing, also in the low villagization districts was affected by the villagization program. So I'm not quite sure if you can do much about it, but maybe it could be discussed. Those are my suggestions. Thank you for your comments. So let me address this first, these three comments, and then we'll, we'll open up to other questions. So our droughts in the early 1970s correlated with weather shocks in subsequent years. I can check that. I can check. I, I know um, the Z score of rainfall for every year for, for all these districts because of my, I have um, annual data on rainfall. So I, I, I will check that. Um, I, I would expect that there isn't um, rainfall shocks. You would expect uh, rainfall shocks to be fairly um, uncorrelated from year to year. And I do control for um, the mean and the standard deviation of rainfall in, in all of my regressions. So they should take care of some of that issue, but um, I, I, will, I will check that. Villagization not randomly distributed, of course. Can you control for distance to urban centers? I, I can easily do that. Right now, I control for the latitude and longitude of the district, the centroid of the district, um, but, I can, I, but I don't control for the distance to the major um, cent urban centers, and I, I, I can easily do that. And with regard to the third comment, I'm, yeah, I, I, will, I will discuss this issue. It's the, um, it is a valid point. I'm not sure, quite sure how to respond to that. Um, but it is, it is something I'll think a little more about. Um, perhaps I can look at only the districts that, were, that weren't heavily villagized. Um, that, might be part, that might partly address that issue. Okay, uh, should we open up to questions? Yeah. So it was really interesting. I, it reminded me that I, 30 years ago, I sort of wrote a book about this, um, and um, which was sort of pretty negative about villagization even then. But um, if we sort of ground it in a bit of theory, um, what, um, you know, what, first of all, people had chosen not to come together. So that kind of, tells you something that there probably aren't big gains from coming together. Um, where do people where do people come together in, in cities and towns and why do they do that? Because the, the cities and towns perform the miracle of, um, of productivity which is um, about scale and specialization. That's what the miracle of productivity is. It's, scale and specialization that's what towns and cities do villages these villages don't do either scale people are still working individual farms right. or specialization they're still all doing the same thing right. so there's not really any um, as it were basis for expecting a, a sort of productivity miracle mm -hmm. um, on the contrary 
you're pushing people against their will, um, and you'd expect a, a short run impact on assets, which is kind of <laughs> pretty plausible. There's an asset loss. You abandon a, a, set, of, a set of assets. Um, and what, I don't know if you've got the basis for looking at it, but in a way what you do is you contrive land scarcity. You know, why do people live in scattered locations? Because they're close to their fields and so can have a lot of them. Right. If you all live in the same place, right. you've actually got to walk a distance to your field. And so you contrive, you conjure up land scarcity in a land abundant environment. And so you might expect that average plot size Average, uh, average farm size would fall. Uh -huh. um, and um, that would then indeed reduce income. So you, I, I'm trying to remember whether I managed to get anything on that all those years ago, and I can't. But I've got some sneaking suspicion that there was some evidence for that, that basically sort of mean plot size fell. Um, a uh, final comment. The, um, I seem to remember... I, I, was, I was in Tanzania at the time this was happening, and I remember visiting the, uh, the sort of Arusha rural area, around Mount, Mount Kilimanjaro, basically. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the sort of local leaders saying, well, of course, um, we're not actually doing village, we're not moving people here. That would be insane, you know. Um, people have got coffee and stuff. So we're just saying, that this area is a, is a village. We're not actually moving people. And that was the high income area of Tanzania, Kalamanjaro. Mm -hmm. High rainfall, coffee and so on. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder whether it would be sensible to drop that area. If your results mm -hmm. are being driven by Mount Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. they're kind of a bit, you know, sort of spurious. So I would be, I would just do a robustness check, okay. drop the, the, um, the obviously right. high income non yeah. non yeah. villagization areas, but overall, just fascinating, uh, really uh, um, very sad. But, uh, but 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 it's important to document these things so that these these sort of initiatives get better grounded in um, in what's the economic rationale for them. Right. I mean, if you look back at the history of the discussion at the time. Uh, it got very angry very rapidly because people did start to question, and uh, there was a, you know, it was seen as a as an affront, basically. But right. anyway, sorry. Yeah. But the literature did trail off after your work in the 1980s in, in other co-authors. The literature completely dropped off until um, a few papers until recently. Um, so it is. So I so I did appreciate um, having access to to your resources as I was doing this research. Okay. Thank you for this very fascinating, interesting presentation. Just a quick comment on the drought. Uh, you used rainfall. Uh, maybe a look if there are data available. There may be uh, data for uh, getting also temperature and build those new index for uh, droughts like the SP or even better, the SPAY index. And uh, yeah. if, if you want, we can talk about yeah. later okay. because I'm using for my own research. Yeah. And I actually took that note during your presentation today. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. So I, I will follow up on that. And um, yeah, that's, thanks for that. Because yeah, um, it's a bit different here. So you may be criticizing a later stage about right. why they use that. Yeah. That okay. And the nice thing about that, that alternate um, measure of uh, weather is that there is access, you have access to that for a pretty long period of time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, very nice work, Annie. Um, just, it's, it's very striking that this effect persists for over such a long period. Uh, so it, it kind of feels that it's kind of a permanent effect. But uh, the good thing is that you have DHS data sets, uh, I think maybe late 90s. So you could look at the asset indexes there and over different DHS runs and see whether there's actually goes down or something like that. Okay, okay, I'll take a look at that, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I was wondering whether there was de-villagization in the 80s and 90s, whether people went back to their farm, uh, which could have a different implication for the reason of persistence. Yeah. So I, I tried to, uh, there isn't much on that issue. Did people move back to, their, to the villages where they lived? Um, and the, the little that I found suggests that people didn't because they, their farms um, were torn down, were burnt down, and there just wasn't, um, a, 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 some people did move back, but the scale of that is um, something no one knows. Um, but it, it, so there wasn't a mass return to, to their previous location. Uh, so I think there was a momentum, people ha were moving, in the, living in these new villages, and there was just this momentum to continue, put, um, to continue living in these villages. Y yeah? Yeah, my, my question is uh, on the districts that, because I, I, I'm, I'm imagining these districts have been subdivided, I don't know how many times since 1970s up to now, mm -hmm. and the rainfall you use is on the district level right. before could be now a region almost, like right. a region now. Yeah. So I'm just wondering the variations, like yeah. how many districts did you have by then and how many are they are now, and so, so whether it's that uh, your measure is really specific to exact uh, communities by then. Yeah. And the second question is on, uh, why not use interaction times? You subdivide like, your samples into, you, know, you have many sub in some of the tables, and I'm wondering if you just use interaction times, and it, because once the sample is subdivided, then it's no longer random. So I was just wondering, right. why not uh, pull the, the data and then use interaction terms rather than subdividing? And okay. the other one was on, uh, yeah, I'll discuss. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, uh, there, uh, I, I did, um, I did pay quite a uh, careful attention to how the district um, districts evolved over time, and they didn't. They haven't. They've changed a little bit. So they've, the uh, districts have split, but they haven't merged, which helps my case. So I did. So the number of districts went up from about 95 in 1978 to about 130 in um, 2010. So so they have increased, but I do pay, pay careful attention to, to that in my work in, in the paper. I'll take that um, comment about interaction term, uh, when I, I'll take that into account when I um, revise my work. Okay. I think we've run out of time. Thank you for uh, attending this session. And, um, <laughs>